A warm welcome to everyone joining us on this wonderful evening. I am Malavika, currently holding the executive editor position at Project Encephalon. I'm a final year industrial biotech student at Anna University. Today marks the end of a momentous journey with Project Encephalon's very own tribute to felicitate the legacy of Spanish neuroscientist Santiago Ramon y Cajal on the occasion of his 169th birth anniversary. I'm elated to welcome the final speaker of Cajal Week, Dr. Aisha, v. Aisha Morales. Dr. Morales is a neuroscientist at Cajal Institute who has been working in the field of developmental biology for the last 20 years. She has been the principal, principal investigator of the Laboratory on Molecular Control of Neurogenesis at Cajal Institute since 2005. Currently, her lab focuses on quiescence as a mechanism of long-term neural stem cell maintenance in adult niches. We are extremely pleased to have you join us today. Participants, please use the chat box for comments and ask your questions on the Q&A box. Thank you very much. Dr. Morales, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Malavika. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. You. Okay, I hope you can see that, it, that is fine. Yes, uh, so first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, the Encephalon Project to give me the opportunity to share uh, our lab data with you today and also to discuss about neurogenesis that is uh, in, in the adult uh, uh, neurobrain. In, in the adult brain, that is one of our uh, favorite subjects. So, um, but first, uh, uh, let me introduce. Yes, let's see if I can move the presentation. Let, let me just try it again. Um, Okay, let's see. No, it's working. Sorry for that. So um, let just uh, first uh, me let uh, to get into the subject by briefly mention that um, last year um, our uh, institute celebrated the the four hundred years um, of uh, of, um, of of its uh, constitution, and you know that it was founded by. Uh, one of the fathers of modern neuroscience that, uh, as you know well, is uh, Santiago Ramón y Cajal. And that um, obviously the Cajal contribution, contributions to neuroscience are many, but just want to point out uh, how um, a improving uh, histological uh, and microscopic uh, techniques uh, together with the, with the uh, witty and um, an artistic uh, brain, he managed to, um, to establish essential con concepts in neuroscience, such as uh, a, a neuronal, neuronal individuality, so the, the, the neuronal theory, um, to describe as the first time the synapses, and as well to describe how the electric impulse, the nervous impulse uh, has a di 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 directionality. So, um, uh, he, I suppose, uh, several uh, uh, um, uh, essential ideas, but also by the end of his days, he was writing that in, in adult centers, the nerve paths are something fixed, uh, ended, and immutable. Everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. But still, he, he left a uh, a door open because he was a very bright, uh, wise man. So he said, it is for the science of the future to change, if possible, this harsh decree. So um, yeah, I bring it here because obviously he was sort of leaving a, a possibility to the future to contribute, to understand maybe um, adult neurogenesis and also regeneration in, in a complex and some uh, uh, an and well-formed um, uh, um, 
mammalian nervous system. So, uh, and obviously, um, uh, Santiago Ramón y Cajal, he knew about the development of the nervous system because he used that a lot as well in his studies. And he knew that, uh, and we know now, <laughs> that um, during development, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of embryonic neural progenitor cells uh, uh, divide rapidly to generate in a first uh, wave um, thousands of different subtypes of neurons, and then in a second wave, um, the glial uh, cells. And now we know, and, and mostly because of um, studies by uh, Joseph Allman in, in the 60s, um, that this process doesn't end up uh, after birth, or it doesn't end up in adulthood, but that there are some uh, discrete areas in the in the in the brain where a subpopulation of these neural progenitor cells remain they can divide although uh, it, they divide rarely and at, at much slow um, pace but they can generate new neurons um, that are fully mature and differentiated and that can get integrated into already established circuits so this gives an extra layer of um, complexity to, to the system so that it gives a plasticity uh, to the nervous system. It doesn't, uh, this plasticity, you know, that doesn't only, does not only will come from the generation of new neurons, but also mostly it comes from the um, uh, modulation and reorganization of synapses and, uh, and dendrites. But this will be an extra layer. So, um, what are these uh, areas where the neural progenitor cells can still generate new neurons with the other brain? So, uh, this um, has been uh, mostly proved for, or more uh, studied in depth in the, in the, in the mice uh, brain. And I am showing just you here a um, sagittal section through the brain where we can see uh, one of these uh, neurogenic niches that is the subventricular ventricular zone that is um, covering the, the walls of the uh, ventricles. And the, uh, one of the other most important or more studied uh, neurogenic niche is the subgranular zone in the dentate gyrus in the hippocampus. Well, these uh, uh, neurons from the subventricular zone, uh, these, um, sorry, uh, progenitors will generate neuroblasts that migrate through the migratory, uh, rostral migratory stream. They will generate different subtypes of olfactory bulb interneurons. In the case of the dentite gyrus, and we can zoom in this area, we, you can see uh, that uh, in the subgranular zone, they are going to be formed a new neuroblast that have this. Um, uh, morphology that they are uh, they are converting into immature granule neurons, and that um, we can label them with a double coating, a, a marker that I'm going to use a lot in this talk. And we know that these uh, 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 neurons are generated uh, because of the presence of neural stem cells, these progenitors that I was telling you about, that are. Um, have a radial glial-like morphology that you can appreciate here, and that majority of them are going to be quiescent. They are not going to be dividing, but a few of them will divide and generate these immature neurons. So this uh, process we know that is uh, much uh, decreased with time. So in, in aging uh, mice, you will uh, observe a drastic reduction of the generation of these new neurons. And also this is mostly due to the fact that these a uh, neural stem cell population uh, become uh, progressively more and more quiescent. And they, uh, by that way, they, they, they don't proliferate and they don't generate new neurons. But um, uh, uh, in order to, uh, 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 to understand how complex is this process of, uh, uh, of understanding adult neurogenesis, I'm going to be just doing a, a, a small historic review of what we know uh, about this uh, uh, process. So how do we uh, analyze uh, uh, adult brain? So, uh, uh, well, this is very basic, I know, but just to, to keep in mind that the way of, of tracking uh, cells in proliferation, one of the uh, 
uh, most important ways is uh, to actually uh, use um, thym thymidine analogs that can be incorporated um, during um, a DNA replication, and that can be incorporated in the in the in the cells generated after mitosis, and that can be follow using different system of detection. So by this way, it was how uh, Joseph Alman and Das in the, in the 60, uh, 4, 65, they discovered the first uh, proliferating um, uh, cells that incorporated um, uh, um, uh, tritiated uh, thymidine in the olfactory bulb of the mouse, yeah? And it was uh, a, a few years later that uh, uh, Fernando Nocebon um, uh, studying the, the brain of uh, some birds such, such as the canary, he uh, uh, revealed as well how there were new production of, of neurons in the brain of this, uh, of this animal. And this has to, to do with the uh, generation of new sons every, every, um, every season. Uh, it was, Years later, in the nineties, that the first evidence of the systems of new neurons being generated in the other brain came for the for the case of the human brain, and this was due to the to the analysis as well using this type of detection system um, in uh, in humans uh, just treated that has been by uh, uh, treated uh, with different. Um, isotopes to, to, to track uh, cancer, uh, they uh, discovered these uh, proliferating cells in the hippocampus of a human being. But um, I mean, the, 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 the field uh, uh, found a, a great impulse um, after the discoveries uh, made using a very sort of uh, uh, aberrant, uh, let's say, uh, kind of experiment. So uh, you, you probably know that during the, the, the Cold War, there were, there were a lot of um, uh, nuclear assets uh, uh, around the world. And this uh, caused a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of isotopes uh, uh, being liberated to the atmosphere. And one of those isotopes is uh, carbon-14 that can be, as you know, very well incorporated into CO2. And from there, it can go into all the, um, all the plant, animals chain uh, through um, to the whole uh, scale. And it can get into our brain, actually. And that was used uh, in a very clever way by uh, the laboratory of uh, Jonas Friesen in Karolinska uh, in, 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 in 2010 um, to actually look for those uh, labeling in uh, the brain of uh, Swedish people uh, from 19 to 29 years. Uh, that has been born uh, throughout the, the 20th century. So uh, he, uh, he took for, from those donated brains of uh, dead people, he took the hippocampus, um, uh, extracted neurons, and uh, actually uh, in, a very, uh, in a very sensitive me method, he could quantify the amount of uh, uh, carbon-14 uh, present in, in those uh, uh, nuclei. So basically what he found, and it's a very complicated um, uh, approach, but what he found is that you could plot in a graph uh, the levels of C14 um, uh, along the 20th century with a peak, as I was telling you, around the peak of the Cold War that it was around uh, 1965 more or less. So you could uh, uh, analyze the level of the C14 in the nuclei of uh, uh, these neurons from people that were born, for instance, in uh, around the uh, mid 60s or around the 70s. And you were trying to see if the level of the C14 in those cells were the ones corresponding to their time of, uh, uh, to the day of birth, I mean, to the time of birth, or it was somewhere different. And what he was finding is that the neurons in the hippocampus had a very different match uh, regarding to the time of uh, birth. So in this case, the blue uh, person that uh, uh, were born at one these days, uh, this uh, light blue person had a level corresponding to much uh, many years later. So that means that these cells of the hippocampus were born um, at least 15, uh, 20 uh, years later after he was born. Yeah. So and that's, that was the same for this, uh, uh, for the analysis done of uh, 
a ten of um, a dozen of people. So, but uh, this wasn't the case for other parts of the brain. So, for instance, in the olfactory bulb, sorry for the Spanish, in the olfactory bulb, what they found is that uh, the uh, amount of uh, carbon uh, 14 was matching perfectly the day of birth, the date of birth of the of the people. So the you are um, uh, uh, your neurons in in the bulb, uh, in the olfactory bulb were uh, born around the time you were born, and and they are not new production of neurons there in the olfactory bulb. But while in the hippocampus, um, what they uh, uh, sort of uh, estimate is that they have run of one. 1,400 new neurons every day in our brain. And they are in our hippocampus. And we think that it, that is in the dental gyrus itself. So, um, but you, 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 you probably are aware that in, in recent uh, years, there has been a lot of discussion about this question of the systems of other neurogenesis in the human brain. And that is mostly because, yeah, apart from uh, detecting the, um, uh, the levels of uh, uh, related to the division of these cells, we wanted to 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 actually see the cells in division, uh, or the, or the or the immature cells, as I was showing you before in the in the mouse brain labeled with double coating. So Arturo Alba de Guilla, that he was as well, I mean, I mean he's a very well known uh, and respected uh, uh, scientist uh, in the field of developmental neurogenesis. So he 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 proved that in the um, in in the uh, developing human uh, um, dental gyrus, you could see uh, a lot of these immature near neurons. The the label with double coating here. You you have you can see them in green. However, if you look at uh, 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 samples older than two years, he could rarely find one of these cells. And in the same line, uh, uh, the laboratory of Homa Adelbeya said, published as well, that these uh, immature neurons was something that only occurred in, in very young infants. However, this was challenged by uh, other groups. And um, I am bringing here, uh, as an example, the, the, the result of the laboratory of Maria Llorens here uh, in Madrid, uh, at the uh, C CBM. And uh, her lab was finding that something very different, that is, was you could actually see these immature new, uh, neurons in human, uh, even uh, as very elder um, age, such as 80. Uh, 80 or 90 years old um, uh, samples. So uh, what they, they could see is that there, there were this population of immature neurons in the dental gyrus of human uh, beings and along the whole life. And also that they can be found in different state of maturation as it would normally happen in, in other uh, mammalian brains such as those of the, uh, of the mice or, or rats. Yeah, but still, this is not uh, a close um, question because we still have to, to see these uh, cells actually, uh, if, if they are being generated as this, uh, at this stage or, or not. But anyway, they also, uh, the laboratory of Maria Llorens also provided very good uh, evidence of the relevance of this population of new uh, newborn neurons in the, uh, in the uh, human brain. Because you know that they were analyzing um, uh, uh, the brains, brain samples of uh, human patients of Alzheimer's disease. And you know that Alzheimer's disease can be organized different BRAC um, stages depending on the severity of the, of the disease. I mean, of the area of affectation from the dental gyrus uh, hippocampus area to, uh, um, to the rest of, uh, I mean, to uh, entorhinal cortex and the rest of the cortex, yeah? So what they, what they could see is that they, if they quantify the number of these in newborn neurons, the double coating one expects, if you can, this is the situation with um, healthy human um, uh, that you can see that they decline a little bit with the age, but not that much. When they were comparing it with the, uh, in, in, in the brain of a uh, Alzheimer's disease patient, what they could find is that there is a correlation of the degree of the severity of the Alzheimer's disease with the loss of the 
uh, newborn neurons. So there is a, a, a newborn neurons in the, in the human adult brain, and the, you lose them in neurodegenerative diseases such as uh, Alzheimer's disease. But obviously, there are a lot of open questions to, 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 to be um, uh, analyzed in the human brain. And, and, and we are, uh, many groups, we are focused on, 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 on a mouse model to understand some of them and uh, to contribute to the general understanding maybe for the human brain as well. So going back to the, to the mouse brain, what we know is that these new, newly generated uh, um, immature uh, granule neurons in the dentate gyrus that you can see them here in green, they actually receive um, input from the uh, entorhinal perforant path. They also um, uh, uh, um, elongate axons and establish connections with the uh, um, uh, CA3 pyramidal neurons, and they are fully integrated into the hippocampal circuit. So, um, but they are not yes, uh, a way of um, a, a, a contributing to generate uh, new neurons after some of them could have died. I mean, it's not just a way of re replenishing the population. They are more than that. They are a young population with a special properties. They are highly active neuronal population. And this only happened during a, a short critical window. So you uh, are always having a pool of young neurons that behave differently differently. And this is, uh, in part, this, be, this behavior of being more highly active is in part because they are poorly coupled to gaba uh, local inhibition. So this, uh, this population of young cells, they, uh, they respond more easily and they contribute differentially uh, to the properties of the circuit. And um, so, what are these uh, functionalities that can be um, uh, generated by the presence of these cells? So we know that they uh, uh, participate, this um, newborn population participate in, in the process of pattern separation in, 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 in the spatial memory. Uh, and we know that because if, if you remove this, the generation of these new neurons using different uh, genetic or um, uh, X-ray strategies, and you and you uh, these uh, animals that lose this population, they perform worse at a spatial task, uh, memory task. Well, if you do the opposite experiment, if you increase this generation of new neurons uh, by different strategies, and one of them I am going to refer to later on is environmental enrichment, the, that extra new neurons that are generated will uh, uh, improve the abilities of the mice to um, uh, recognize uh, differences in the pattern in uh, a, a spatial memory task, yeah? And also uh, they are, uh, seems to be involved as well in, in process like depression and anxiety. So yes, in mice, they have a clear role and it has been demonstrated, we don't know yet, what role could be they playing in the human brain. Yeah, but now, uh, after this uh, introduction, I, I just uh, would like to, uh, to talk, uh, focus in what are the questions that my laboratory is interested in, in this context. So we are mostly focusing the signals and the genetic programs that control the new generations uh, of neurons in the adult brain using the mouse as model system. So just let me to introduce you a little bit some aspect of what is going on in these niches. So we have been looking at first, as, as I was showing you of this uh, radial glial-like uh, population. These are the neural stem cells. So I was telling you they are mostly in a uh, quiescent state that is uh, uh, reversible because they can be um, activated and they, uh, by different signals and they can start uh, dividing and generate uh, intermediate progenitor cells that actually um, uh, can exit cell cycle and differentiate, um, giving rise to uh, granule um, uh, neurons that initially immature and progressively they get mature, as I was telling you before. So, but these uh, 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 neural stem cells, they can also adopt uh, uh, glial uh, fates and 
uh, and in certain circumstances, they will give rise to astrocytes as well. Yeah, uh, as I was telling you, we, we, we have different markers to be able to recognize the cells, not only the double coating for this population, as I was telling you, but also we have all this batch of uh, markers that many of them are shared as well with astrocytes, but that allow us to identify this population. And uh, also we, we have identified many signals that in, in the adulthood, they control some of these processes, especially we, we know that BMP signals uh, together with not signaling are responsible of maintaining these cells in a quiescent state, while others such as EGF or uh, wind signaling pathway are more involved in the proliferation and the expansion of this ball. Yeah. So we are in my laboratory, we are especially interested in uh, what is, uh, how is maintained this process of quiescence and how is it regulated so that you can generate new neurons in spite of having a, a, a very pro quiescent uh, a niche throughout the life of the, of the animal. That is actually the way that uh, this helped you to, to have a, a long lasting uh, neurogenic niche as well. So um, just uh, uh, to, to mention briefly that this uh, 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 quiescent state is, is, is a complex uh, state that has, that has been uh, sort of uh, analyzed by single cell RNA sec by the group of Hunyan Son, but also in other contexts by the group of uh, Ana Martin Villalba. And what they have found is that this is sort of it's a mixed state. This is not, uh, there's a, a sort of uh, progression from a very more dormant state where, where you don't have a, uh, any, any sort of um, cell cycle elements being activated, but also you have a very different metabolism state. Um, so mostly a fatty acid metabolism. And progressively, you are become more engaged into a, a cell cycle program. And this is uh, this intermediate state is what we call resting or primal state that is uh, more and more progressively being identified as a state where the cells are more uh, easy uh, to respond to uh, a mitogenic signals. And uh, uh, so this will be, we don't know if it is a transient state uh, or is, is it a, a different identity, a different population that is uh, there um, till they finally uh, uh, get uh, active. So we have this more resting and more dormant. That is an important thing to keep in mind. So uh, my um, uh, before that, uh, 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 our laboratory as well has been for long been interested in transcription factor of the SOC family. That we know that uh, uh, by different assays, we know that they are highly expressed uh, in uh, in some of these uh, different uh, states, and we think that they could play a role there, although it has not been uh, proved so far. So uh, for some of them. So we became interested in SOX5 transcription factor that we, uh, we have a character that is expressed in these neural stem cells um, in the adult neurogenic niches, um, like the, the Tegeris one. And what uh, we uh, were interested in knowing is if they could actually play a role in this transition, as we knew from development that they were very important in the control, for instance, of cell cycle exit. So uh, what we did in our laboratory was to use um, a inducible conditional uh, mice so that we, we can remove uh, this uh, transcription factor, SOX5, and a very related one, that is SOX6, from the other uh, um, neural stem cells using a SOX2 CREERT, that is, uh, as you can see here, um, drive a, a recombination in the neural stem cells although as well it to be in the astrocytes. And we can follow this recombination, as you can see here, using a, a, a reporter, a GLFP line. In order to induce this recombination, uh, we use uh, tamoxifen because it's a ERT driven uh, CREA. And uh, we can uh, do that at, in, in, in animals uh, two, three months uh, old. So it's a, a young uh, adult and analyze what happened with the cells uh, that uh, have lost SOX5 or SOX6 7, 14, or 30 days after. 
to follow actually the, 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 the destiny. So what, what we uh, uh, have found uh, is that these uh, uh, neural stem cells that, that we can recognize here by the morphology and the expression of uh, some of the markers, we can see that upon losing SOX5 or SOX6, uh, the proliferation of these cells uh, get much reduced. We are using here a proliferation marker that is MCM2, yeah, here in red. So, um, um, uh, so in this uh, situation, what we observe, as, as I was saying, is that there is a reduction in the activation of the neural stem cell. So we analyze as well if that is uh, actually accompanied by uh, a, 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 a reduction of the cells in this uh, quiescent state. And for that, to follow these cells that we don't have a specific markers for them, what we had to do is uh, to label with BRDU and do uh, a uh, and chase them uh, uh, 30 days after, so that only the cells that won't uh, be dividing a lot, um, so those that um, are entering quiescent are the ones that are going to retain the BRDU. So basically what we observe is that these cells that we can see here in white that have retained the BRDU after one month, and that they have lost as well SOX5, or uh, SOX5, what we, we can see is that this, this population, this quiescent population is enlarged in the SOX5 mutant. So um, uh, 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 SOX5 is required for the activation of these uh, neural stem cells, but also is required uh, sort of to prevent an excessive return to quiescent. As I was telling you before, this uh, quiescent state is uh, uh, reversible and cells, we know, we are starting to know that they can move between these two, uh, these two stages, especially um, the one that are, are, are more resting, less dormant state. So um, uh, in order to determine what, how was uh, SOX5 playing this role, we, uh, we went to search for um, uh, known uh, genes that are uh, required for the activation of these cells. And one of the uh, genes that has been characterized is a proneural gene called ACL1, and that is uh, required for the activation of these neural stem cells. And this gene is, uh, has been demonstrated that it requires certain post uh, transcriptional uh, modification in order to adjust its level. So, but we wanted to know if there were as well some um, control of the level of the transcription. So we, sorry. So uh, we, what we did was we analyzed in our mutants uh, the level of, SOC, of ACL1 in these neural stem cells that we can recognize here very easily. So, and we observed that both in SOX5 and SOX6 mutant, there is a reduction of this proneural gene that is required for activation. So that makes sense. But also what we found is was that uh, analyzing conserved region in the, in the ACL1 um, uh, locus in uh, 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 um, uh, uh, what we found was conserved SOX binding site that we could prove that at least SOX6 uh, was able to bind directly to this uh, uh, um, conserved uh, binding sites and be responsible for the transcription of ACL1. So we, 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 uh, we have demonstrated that SOX5 and SOX6 uh, are required for the activation and that uh, that could be mediated through the transcription of ACL1. But uh, in order as well to, to understand the, um, the behavior of these, uh, of these transcription factors in, in neural stem cells, what we uh, used was uh, to resource to a system that allow us to culture these neural stem cells um, uh, uh, using uh, mitogens, these uh, uh, neural stem cells from the adult dentigerous can be grown as neosphere or can be attached um, uh, to plates using different uh, extracellular matrix components. And uh, we can uh, change the level of, um, I, I mean, we can add signals such as BMP and we can force these cells to enter quiescence. So if we give a BRDU pulse, these cells in the presence of BMP cannot divide. They, and this is a reversible as well 
quiescent. So we, what we found in these conditions is that obviously if you add BMP, you, you actually activate the, uh, the BMP pathway and the target. And in this situation, SOX5 and SOX6 is highly decreased. So one of the modulators of, uh, of uh, the level of SOX5 and SOX6, that's why they are required for the activation is BMP. So BMP will silence these, um, uh, these genes. So and, uh, not only the transcription, but as well, uh, the level of, uh, of SOX5 protein. Um, we also uh, using this system, what we check it was what happened if we uh, elevate the levels of SOX5. What uh, happened to uh, to the uh, quiescent uh, entry? And for that, we we can put this cell in culture. We can electroporate them uh, uh, with for them to spread SOX5. And in this condition, what we observe is when we put them in just proliferation condition using just the mutagens I was telling you, there is no changes. The, the uh, cells with overexpression of SOX5 behave the same. But if we challenge, challenge them to go into quiescent, the cells that have high level of SOX5, those here, they will remain in proliferation. So actually uh, having high level of, um, of uh, uh, SOX5 um, uh, prevent cells uh, to enter uh, into quiescent. So, um, but has this anything, uh, I mean, does this alteration of the activation of the neural stem cells have a consequence on the generation of new neurons? So we, we, we analyze um, uh, the, uh, the expression of double coating to follow these immature neural neurons, as I was telling you before, and we could see that uh, um, uh, at all the, the time courses after deletion of SOX5 or SOX6, there were a reduction in the uh, number of neon neurons being generated. So yes, uh, um, losing SOX5 has a consequence of the activation and has a consequence of the, has, uh, I mean, redu produce a reduction, I mean, um, on the neurogenesis. So, um, as, as I mentioned you uh, at some point at the beginning of the talk, uh, you remember that uh, environmental enrichment is a condition uh, together with uh, physical exercises can promote the generation of the new neurons in the brain of the mice. Um, and this has been uh, known for, for a while now. However, this was, uh, it was thought that this occurred because there were a higher survival of this population of intermediate progenitor that is quite, although I haven't mentioned it before, it's controlled by, uh, by apoptotic signal. So it was thought that environmental enrichment act at this level. What we, we have um, uh, now seen uh, in the context of this uh, project is that uh, when you um, put this animal in, 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 in in, in this type of condition, environmentally enriched uh, condition, what we observe looking at the um, proliferation of these nearly stem cells, as I was showing you before with the MCM2, what we could see is that the, this condition uh, um, increased the uh, proliferation, the activation of the neural stem cells. Yeah, you can see it here. So it, uh, now we have seen that it acts as well at this level. And what happens if we lose SOX5? If SOX5 is required for the activation of these neural stem cells, what we could see is obvious is that losing SOX5 prevent these neural stem cells uh, to, uh, from responding to the environmental enriched um, situation. So now we have in the, in the, in the mutant, in the SOX5 mutant, what you have is that these um, uh, neural uh, stem cells cannot uh, respond uh, uh, to this uh, uh, enrichment. So um, yes, as, as, a, as a brief summary of what I have said uh, so far in relation to the uh, function of SOX5 and SOX6, um, uh, uh, we have concluded that they are required for the activation of the neural stem cells in the other brain of the mouse in, in the context of the dentate gyrus. This, uh, they are uh, acting through the uh, transcription of a proneural gene, that is ACL1, and they are, the levels are controlled by 
signal su such as BMPs. And uh, these uh, 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 transcription factors are required for these cells to respond to environmental uh, uh, um, uh, cues, en enriched cues, yeah? So, um, but uh, our laboratory uh, is interesting as well in, uh, as a way of understanding how this other neurogenesis uh, work. Well, um, uh, we think that is to understand how initially these other neural stem cells um, were generated, how they acquire their quiescent state. It's essential to, to understand how they behave in the adult um, situation. So uh, what is the origin of these other neural stem cells in the hippocampus? So um, uh, uh, for that, just uh, let me briefly comment uh, to you that uh, this, uh, that you know that uh, the uh, hippocampus and the dentite gyrus are generated uh, from the near epithelium um, uh, of the pallium region next to the cortical hem that is a, a uh, one of the organizer regions in here in the dorsal part of the brain next to the cortex. So in this uh, um, purple area, the, the, um, sorry, in this um, uh, red area, the dentate gyrus and neuroepithelium, um, there is um, this uh, epithelial, neuroepithelial cells are going to be delaminating, um, uh, migrating, uh, th uh, uh, forming, through the uh, next to the hippocampal fissure when when the the hippocampus fall, uh, they are going to be forming there the um, the uh, dentate gyrus as a separate uh, area from the neuroepithelium, and this uh, uh, in this area this uh, um, combination of neural progenitors and radial glial cells that are migrating through here they don't start differentiating till um, the first week. Postnatally, so it is the development is very much pro protracted in time if you compare it with other part of the brain such as the cortex. So and it it's not going to be till the the second week or um, that this um, a, a structure of the uh, this position of the radial glial cells here are going to be observed. And they are going to be forming this subgranular zone, although now it's still not very well defined with many progenitors is, is, uh, still here in the helos and distributed throughout the blades of the, the, of the dentate gyrus. And it's not going to be till P30, very late, uh, one month after being born, that uh, the actual uh, neural, um, uh, uh, adult neurogenic niche is fully uh, established as we know it in the adult um, uh, situation. So uh, it takes about one month and we, we, we think that, it, uh, that there are many things also changing after that. But anyway, so uh, uh, we observed that SOX5 transcription factor when we uh, uh, were analyzing as well during the development of the dental gyrus is expressed in, in most of the uh, progenitors and it accompanied the um, the development of the of the uh, dentate the gyrus, and um, we know as well that around the first week, the first postnatal week that I was telling you, that is when differentiation starts. They have um, the group of Hondjanson and the group of Samuel Pleasure has determined that there are uh, uh, some of the radial glial cells that uh, are the ones the progenitors working in development some of them will, will get, uh, enter into quiescent. Yeah, and we, we think that as well by that time, there, there must be some changes in the specificity of these radial glial cells so that they acquire other properties that we don't know yet we, we, what are they exactly, uh, to become the radial glial-like cells of the album. Yeah, and a little bit later, and it has been shown very just very recently, uh, from P30 onwards, um, these um, uh, radial glial-like cells, these adult ones, are going to be able to progressively enter into uh, returning to quiescent after uh, 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 going through several rounds of division. So this return to quiescent and, and especially to a deep quiescent state is something that get, um, that the cells progressively acquire during time after P30. Yeah, so there are all these changes, but we don't know really what, 
uh, are, how is this controlled? And also we don't know much about how these equilibrium are maintained and organized or what actually mean this, uh, what I am drawing here. We, we don't know very much about that. So what we um, uh, decided to question is if SOX5 is so important in the, in the adult brain to control the activation of the neural stem cells, maybe during, during the development, um, being expressed in all the neural stems, in, in all the progenitors, maybe it's important to control um, the acquisition of the, the new abilities of the uh, adult neural stem cells. So what we decided was to remove SOX5 uh, early on using a nesting free line uh, that will delete this gene from 12.5. And what we observed was that uh, uh, there is a, a, at P14, so um, two weeks after uh, birth, we observed that there they were um, a, a slight reduction in the size of the dentate gyrus and a little uh, a proliferation. And in fact, if we, if we just focus on the, these uh, neural stem cells, um, uh, uh, using again uh, our marker for proliferation, would we uh, could see was that there were a, a, a reduction in the ability of these cells to proliferate when they are uh, losing uh, SOX5. That that was in coincident to, to what we, we we saw in the adult. But um, we decided to look further to see if this has long-term consequences. Uh, sorry, just uh, uh, to summer uh, some of other results is that we uh, demonstrated that uh, actually the these cells, um, uh, this quiescent cell has been properly established. So they, they, if you look at the numbers of uh, quiescent uh, uh, cells um, using this long BRDU experiment that I was telling you before, there are no changes. So they, these cells in the first week were able to enter quiescent. That's not a problem. But what seems to be affected is the possibility of these cells to uh, um, uh, enter in, into proliferation again, yeah? So what happened when we look at P30? What, we, we were very surprised to see that in this situation, just two weeks afterwards, uh, what we were seeing, uh, these cells uh, start now uh, uh, increasingly uh, becoming more and more active. These neural stem cells that were not proliferating uh, efficiently two weeks before now, uh, uh, proliferate too much. So um, uh, uh, what, we, uh, um, what we have observed as well at the, that, that this uh, uh, expansion of the active uh, pool um, maybe has as a consequence, and we, we are analyzing this, that there is, we, what we can see is that there, there are less cells uh, being quiescent. And what we are actually seeing is that these active neural stem cells are able to return uh, to a quiescent, but we think that this quiescent state that they are returning to is a very much this uh, superficial uh, resting, uh, more um, shallow quiescent state. And in this situation, what we, uh, what we are now uh, uh, in the way of, of proving is that we think that uh, SOX5 is required um, for the uh, uh, also for the um, RGLs to enter a, a proper dormant quiescent state during late development. I mean, with the lack of SOX5, they tend to, to go back to a very shallow one state. And that uh, is important because it, if we now look at the output of this, that is the generation of new neurons, what we see is that at this state, P30, that the, the, the uh, neural stem cells are are active, very actively proliferating in the mutants, they generate many more uh, new neurons. You can see uh, here by eye, but we can see as well the comparison here, P30. While if you wait for longer, what it actually uh, becoming more progressively, and still we are, uh, these are uh, preliminary data here. Uh, what we can see is that uh, at the end, what you, you, you end up is losing this uh, ability to generate new neurons progressively with, with time. So you have uh, uh, probably um, uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, you have an acquired proper dormant quiescent, you are um, uh, uh, 
running out of neural stem cells in earlier uh, during life. So um, yes, uh, to try to summarize a little bit what I, I have uh, told you, uh, we, we think that uh, these transcription factors are very uh, uh, are essential to control the activation of neural stem cells in, in the adult brain. And that during uh, postnatal uh, neurogenesis, we think that uh, they uh, are involved as well, not only in the control of the activation of the neural stem cells once they have acquired pyosin, but also in the in the in the control of uh, the of these cells to going back to a, a progressively uh, more quiescent uh, dormant state that will ensure you that the um, neural um, uh, stem cells last uh, for uh, your whole life and that are able to be uh, responding to activated uh, uh, cues uh, uh, for the rest of your life and not to extenuate the pool in very few uh, months. So um, yes, uh, uh, finally, I want to, to thank of the people in my lab. This is not a very actual uh, picture. Uh, we cannot gather without the mask uh, for pictures nowadays, but we will do soon. Um, uh, the, the, the stories I, I have been telling you about uh, has been mostly the effort of uh, Lin Ling uh, um, Lee, um, uh, and Christina uh, Medina with the help of uh, uh, Ines Colmena and also the help of different uh, uh, students that has been in the lab such as Rafa Lopez, Eva Montserrat and now we have the help of uh, Maria Valdez, Almudena Sanz, Rasika Rajesh and very, just very recently Pilar Rodriguez to thank as well our funding agencies and our collaborations in the, at the Cajal Institute and also um, abroad. And thank you for your attention. I will uh, take uh, your questions. That was a wonderful talk, ma'am. Really insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. We have a, a few questions here. First one was, what happened when SOX was overexpressed? Can it cause tumor-like situations? Um, yes, I mean, uh, we, we, we haven't done the in vivo experiment, we, we, we are planning to. Uh, we have only done a, a situation of uh, the in vivo system, but we don't think uh, that um, if, if you ever express just SOX5 on its own um, uh, without any other alterations, I don't think that it's going to, 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 to promote uh, overgrowth. Um, in fact, in some of the in some of, of the other niches, uh, such as um, uh, uh, the subventricular zone, seems that uh, is uh, a little bit the opposite. That if you uh, have a situation where you when when you have a, um, when you promote um, a, uh, an oncogenic damage, and there are for, for instance, by overexpressing oncogenes uh, uh, such as RAS, uh, losing SOX5 uh, uh, in that case, in the different context, cause you um, a, a higher uh, rate of proliferation. So I think that SOX5 and SOX6 are very much depending on, on the state of the cell and the cellular context, um, context because, um, um, what they may mostly do is that uh, they uh, uh, compete uh, for the binding socks binding sites with other socks uh, factors, and they can modulate the, the activity of others. So you you can find socks uh, five and socks six doing apparently contradictory things depending on which is the uh, the cell type and the and the context. Yeah. But we don't think that in the dental gyrus an overexpression of SOX5 will cause any uh, tumor. I think that the, the, the cells have many other um, uh, breaks and other uh, in, in, in programs, genetic programs to prevent um, um, uh, this uh, oncogenic uh, growth um, easily. So I don't think that that's going to happen. Yeah. 
Great. Uh, another attendee wants to know what went wrong in the notorious Alvarez Buera paper and whether you agree with them or not. In, in, the, in the world, sorry, can you repeat the question? Or? The notorious Alvarez Buela paper. Um, what went wrong with the Alvarez? Ah, the Alvarez, Alvarez Buella paper. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, um, uh, I, this has been, I mean, there has been a lot of discussions that, I mean, in fact, very recently, I mean, a couple of years ago, they, all of these uh, people I put you in, in, the, in, in the context, they meet uh, uh, in a meeting and they discuss about this thing. And they are very recently published a back to back paper uh, in Journal of Neuroscience discussing again this question. So basically, I, I think that uh, 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 the, the fact that uh, Arturo Alvarez Builla, being one of the experts on the field, couldn't find this uh, uh, double coating positive cells uh, could maybe had to do with the way of um, preserving these uh, human uh, uh, brain samples that you know that are very difficult to get and that are very, very difficult to, to handle. And double coating, we know uh, that in any species is, is uh, is is a very unstable protein that you you can easily lose if you do a, a bad perfusion or if you keep your samples for too long before being processed. So I think that uh, a, it was clearly proved that there there is some um, um, technical issues. Uh, said saying that uh, the, the 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 open the, the question is still open because as I was telling you. Uh, one thing is to demonstrate that we have immature new neurons, and a different thing is to demonstrate that they have been born um, uh, at adult ages. Uh, by the result of uh, Jonas Friesen that I was presenting you, suggests that they were born um, at adult ages, but uh, we have to put everything together. Like, let's say we have to find the neural stem cells um, in the human adult brain. And we have to see if they are able to generate and proliferate and um, generate new neurons. And, and we don't know that yet. I mean, because it's a, probably, it's going to be a, a population that is very differently organized in the human brain. You, you, to start with, you don't even have a proper subgranular zone. And uh, like the one we see in the mice. So I think that there are still many things to do before being sure of that. But yeah, I, I, I think that anyway, uh, yeah, uh, Arturo has done a great job uh, as well, analyzing all the developmental stages. And he has uncovered that there are immature ne uh, new neurons in other areas that we, we didn't know before, such as an amygdala, for instance, uh, on another uh, part of the, um, of the cortex. So there are many open new questions on, on the development and the uh, adult neurogenesis in the human brain that need to be solved, yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, now, Pavan Pandit would like to ask you a live question, please. Hello, am I audible? Yes, hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, ma'am. So you said the uh, in adult uh, brain, like the hippocampus region, the neurons like uh, they form like uh, repetitively, like continuously. So do they migrate to the other region which are uh, affected? For instance, let's say there's an injury to other part of the brain. So do they migrate from the hippocampus to the injury region? No, it doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, when, when there is a brain injury, uh, it, it's, it, it has been demonstrated that there are migration from the subventricular zone um, in, in the mice, uh, and probably as well in um, these cells can migrate not only to the cortex, but also to the striatum. But in the case of the dentate gyrus, I think that because they are so packed in the dentate gyrus, you know, the granule uh, layer in the dentate gyrus is one of the high, more highly packed uh, regions in brain with more, um, I mean, the, 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 the sum of the cells are really 
very close to each other and these cells cannot actually escape from there. I mean, so um, the only thing that you, you could see maybe in a very uh, pathological situa situation such as we stand in, uh, in epilepsy, uh, because there is a lot of uh, neur uh, neur uh, neuronal loss and a lot of cell death, even in the dental gyrus. By that way, uh, the, the, because the, 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 the tissue is partially destroyed, you will see some dental uh, uh, immature neurons that can be um, like moving or, I mean, out of place. But I mean, that is a very severe situation that that doesn't account, but no, you you won't see in a if you have a, I don't know a, an ictus or a brain injury um, by contusion in other part of I mean for instance in the cortex, you're not going to see these cells migrating out of the hippocampus. No. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Morales, uh, Radha Pratik had uh, raised her hand during the talk. I think she may have a question. Uh, she's yes. allowed to talk, but she probably does not want to talk. We can move ahead. Ah, uh, okay. Well, they said they were a question something. Saying, I, I saw it briefly uh, about uh, if these uh, neural stem cells, if these radial glial like cells can divide infinitely or if they have a limited number of divisions, I, somewhere it was that question. And it's, I think it's a very good, a good question. Um, so far, what we, we know is that they have a limited number of division before actually going into a sort of permanent quiescent or, um, or actually giving rise to neurogenic divisions and, and, and just uh, disappear, no? I mean, by division. Uh, so uh, it seems that there's around three, three four times uh, the number of divisions. This has been very nicely shown, especially by the lab of uh, Sebastian Jesberger, using time lapse um, microscope to follow in vivo in the, in the mouse brain um, the divisions of these neural stem cells, of these radial glial-like cells. They could label them with, uh, 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 with genetic tools to trace them and to follow them for bands. And they, and, and they, they have been tracing all the, uh, all, all, all the tree of division and, and, and which type of cells do they generate and everything. And they have seen that they, they, they divide a very limited number of times, yeah. But uh, that is as an average. Uh, many of these studies has been done in a sort of population level, and we don't know if at individual level, uh, maybe you will find one of these cells that um, is able to divide more times, but it only does that every two months or every, every month or something like that, and they can end up dividing more times. I mean, I, I, we 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 don't know many many things about these cells and and, and the let's say the the dynamics of it, these cells along along the life of the animal. So yeah, this, some of these conclusions uh, are still at the population level, and we don't know yet if we can identify different type of cells that do different things. Now, attendee wants to know about shallow lesions. Yeah. And more, more on it. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a concept, really new one. It, I mean, we, we call it shallow because it's this these cells. If you uh, look at the transcriptomic profile, is that you have a group of cells that um, are not dividing. They 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 uh, they are not engaged in cell cycle division, but they are they 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 are they have started expressing um, a, a, a markers of uh, so some of this cell cycle markers, although they are not engaged in, in cycle division. And uh, the characterization of that, some of these cells, apart from the uh, single cell RNA-seq, has come as well very recently from the laboratory of uh, 
uh, Isabel Fariñas in, 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 the, in University of Valencia here in, in, in Spain, um, uh, where she has been putting these cells in culture. And actually, when you take these uh, neural stem cells from the dentia gyros and grow them as neurospheres, actually, none of them are quiescent cells, um, the dormant quiescent one, because those don't proliferate, you cannot, you cannot keep them there. But uh, uh, what she was doing is to characterize these cells that are growing in culture, and a proportion of them are these, what she called prime or shallow quiescent ones. And they are not proliferating. Um, uh, they, they take, um, I mean, they, uh, it, it takes uh, longer for them to proliferate. They are not as active as the, let's say, what we call the active neural stem cells. Uh, and they have a, transcriptoma, um, a transcriptomic profile that is similar to what we, we see in vivo as this uh, transition between the dormant state and the active state. So we uh, don't know yet if um, this is just a transient state or actually they are a different subset of cells that uh, we don't know if all the neural stem cells go through a phase of uh, being shallow or prime quiescent, or it's just a subpopulation of the whole pool that can do that, of being more ready to, dis to respond and to start uh, being active, yeah? So uh, yeah, uh, these things uh, we don't know yet because we are in early days about the characterization of this um, uh, subpopulation of, uh, neural stem cells and quiescent and neural stem cells, yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Estra Caraca wants to thank you for the great talk and she wants to know about the proliferation capacity of the RGLs uh, and if it is finite or infinite. Yeah, that, that's uh, the question I think I was responding before. Yeah, that's uh, um, uh, within that, that is uh, at least in the dental gyros. Yeah, and we think that the capacity of proliferation is higher in the, in the superventricular zone. The, the capacity in the dental, there are RGLs in the dental gyros, as I was telling you, is to go through three to four division as a average as population. And in the subventricular zone, we have the impression that they can they can do more round of division. In fact, if you put in culture uh, neural stem cells coming from the SB set or from the dentite gyrus, is uh, the SB set goes like crazy. I mean, they divide much more rapidly, uh, more easily to grow. Uh, so uh, yeah, definitely they they have at least in the in the mouse uh, brain they have a. Uh, uh, for sure, different um, uh, rates of division and number of division that they can go through. But for sure, it's, it's not going to be infinity. I, I don't think that it's going to be the case. It's going to be maybe a higher number of division, but yeah, it's, it, for sure it will be restricted because this has to be necessarily a very contained uh, neurogenic process. You don't want to interfere with the whole um, in this case, olfactory valve that you have been building during the development, you're not going now to, to put there loads of, um, of, of cells that can uh, alter this. Although, yeah, you, you benefit a lot from the incorporation of these new neurons that maybe are required for the acquisition of new sensibility to others or, uh, or whatever, but, they, but for sure they are not going to be an infinite number, yeah or very large number, let's say infinite is nothing but a very large number. Roshana wants to know, can neurogenesis be artificially indu induced in in vivo environment by stimulating uh, the pluripotent stem cell factors uh, with the pluripotent stem cell factors in the neurogenic niche of an adult hi hippocampus? Yeah, well, ma many of the research uh, nowadays is, um, is trying to uh, to induce this uh, neurogenic uh, potential in these uh, in these cells by by overexpressing uh, uh, different factors. For instance, um, I mean there are there there are, there are many, uh, uh, but, but uh, if, if for instance in in the adult um, 
in, in other uh, niches such as the um, uh, spinal cord neural stem cell niche, they, they have been uh, uh, laboratories like the Jonas Friesen I was telling you before, uh, they are overexpressing, for instance, OLIC2, these uh, uh, neural stem cells that normally they don't even give rise to neurons or to anything else apart from certain astrocytes. They, if you modify the expression of these cells, for instance, uh, making them to express OLIC2, they are able to generate oligodendrocytes and they will respond uh, to an injury. In, in the case of the of the dentate gyrus, there are many many of the oh, many strategies to uh, to increase the number of these cells. For instance, if you if you manage to get higher level levels of proneural genes such as ACL1, as I was telling you, uh, just for instance blocking its degradation, these. Uh, uh, the integers will produce more neurons. The problem in this, and th that, that is many of the our investigation is going through a, that uh, point, is that if you force too much uh, the neural stem cells to divide a lot and generate many neurons, what is happening is that your niche will last um, a shorter time and you are going to extinguish it very, very quickly. So what we need to, to learn and to know how to to, to deal is with the situation where you want to in, uh, get these cells activated, but at the same time, not to get them exhausted because um, either to know how to uh, increase the number of cell division that they can go through uh, and overpass these three, four times, as I was telling you, or um, being able to modulate uh, this return to quiescent. If you if you get them to return to quiescent from time to time, maybe they will last you for longer. Because otherwise, if, if you just activate them, uh, you lose them in very uh, few uh, uh, weeks or months, and you don't want that. So, yeah, I'm seeing that they, they have a great potential uh, for regeneration. Um, uh, but we need to, to do much, to, to know much more about how to balance these um, states. Yeah. Uh, Radha Parikh has a question. What type of food promotes neurogenesis? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, um, if you mean in, in mice, obviously, <laughs> it, uh, what what this has been now is that uh, generally, uh, uh, well, it, I, I'm going to tell you what what you all know about what is a, a healthy uh, style of living, and it's always the same. If you do exercise, uh, you you get you 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 are able to to form more new neurons. If you are surrounded by exciting things or uh, by exciting inputs, uh, you form more neurons. And in the case of the of the diet, what they have seen is that the high fat diet, uh, probably because that is as well sometimes associated to less movement or uh, less activity. That um, uh, although it, it it as well can have a, an hypo, a hypothalamic uh, uh, connection because there has been uh, some uh, ideas that hypothalamus, uh, that there, there are as well some near, new neurons we have formed in, near, uh, in hypothalamus, and we don't know yet how that is balanced to the uh, food uptake or, uh, but uh, uh, we think that that maybe has as well a, a connection. But so far the, the type of experiments uh, are very basic and they haven't been like dealing with the proper connection to which cells are then uh, activated if for which type of food or but what is more uh, clearly um, what is more convincing is this link between um, uh, environmental enrichment, uh, physical exercise, and there's uh, molecules such as IGF and BDNF that are mediating that activity on the brain. And even in fact, uh, even the uh, environmental, uh, sorry, the uh, physical exercise can increase the activity of the granule cells, the mature one, and those extra activity will have an impact on the neural stem cells uh, proliferation. So yeah, that's, we are now uh, going through the molecular level to connect this uh, physiological 
external activity to actually the cell behavior. But yeah, there are many things yeah, that need to be done, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Morales, for joining us this evening. It was a really interesting and insightful talk. And uh, thank you so much for patiently answering all our questions. Now, I would like to invite our founder uh, of Project Encephalon, Pranjal. Hello, uh, I am Pranjal, current president of Project Encephalon. Thank you so much, Dr. Morales, for a very, very exciting talk. Adult neurogenesis is my personal interest, and I am really interested in the subject. Thank you so much for being here. With this talk, we end the celebrations of Kahal Week that marked the 169th birth anniversary of Dr. Santiago Ramoni Kahal. It included seven brilliant talks, one panel discussion, and an exhibition by Kahal Legacy. Really grateful to all the attendees, speakers, panelists, Kahal Institute, especially for providing us photographs on a very short notice. The entire team of Project Encephalon for making Kahal Week a very successful event. Uh, it included more than 600, more than 650 registrants. I'm really grateful to all of you. I'm also grateful to Scientist Inc. for sponsoring the event, for providing us with the Zoom webinar. We at Project Encephalon invite all of you to join us as a member to attend many more events like this. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Morales, you were saying something? No, yes. Uh, thank you for the great initiative and uh, congratulations for all this effort and, and the big success. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marcos.